All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangout. My name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts, uh, where folks can join in, um, anyone who is working on a website and has questions around their website and web search. Um, we, we can discuss these questions and find or try to find some solutions. Um, a bunch of questions were submitted already on YouTube, which is awesome. Uh, so we can go through some of those. But uh, as always, if any of you want to get started with a question, feel free to jump on in. I have a question, if you let me. Sure. Uh, I wonder if Google Bots can crawl user to events on a page or not. What, what kind of pages? Uh, I'm asking that uh, Googlebot can crawl or not uh, user triggerable events on a page, like scroll events or JavaScript events. I am also talking about. Yeah, usually not. Usually. So not. how can I show this uh, to the Googlebot, like dynamic rendering or HTML snapshots? What kind of a technology I can use? Yeah, so anything like dynamic rendering works, uh, anything that you can do to make it so that the content loads with the link rather than mm -hmm. an interaction, um, that, that helps as well. So, so let's say I am using a pop-up, uh, which can be seen after 30 seconds sessions. So I wonder if Googlebot can see this or not. Maybe. 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 So we we render the page, and we try to give it a bit of time to settle down. Um, but if you're doing something where in 30 seconds something changes on the page, I don't know if if that's like long enough wait that Googlebot has already rendered the page, or if Googlebot is still rendering the page. So okay, I have another question. Sure. So let's say I am refreshing the uh, web page after 30 seconds, and I am redirecting it uh, to the another URL. So Googlebot uh, can see this or not because it is a kind of sneaky redirect, as you know. Yeah. So may maybe we can see that. That's similar. If, if you're it's against waiting, the great lies, right? Yeah. If you're waiting a certain period of time, then it's possible that we can see that. It's possible that we don't see that. OK. Thank you, John. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> Hi, John. Hi. Uh, we uh, we have got a question from one of our client. Uh, they want this clarification. So the question is, if they show their Google review on their website, will that affect their ranking? Will that help to improve their ranking? What what are they showing on the on the site? Uh, uh, Google business listing review. So the review they are getting on their Google business listing, if they show those review on their website, how does it impact their ranking? I don't think it would impact the ranking at all. So okay. uh, it's not that we, we would rank it higher, definitely because of the review content. Um, if they use the, the markup for the review for their business on their business homepage, we would not show those review stars. Um, and like may, maybe there's something in the reviews that is content that they wouldn't otherwise have on the page. Like if a customer writes about their service and they don't have the service described on their page, then that might be something where it could rank. Uh, but uh, by definition, just by having the, a Google review or any kind of review on a page doesn't make it rank better or worse. And uh, one more question. Uh, so. That we have found recently that some of our clients have a lot of issue with their structured data. And most of the structured data actually are generating from the markup. So those markup actually generated by WordPress plugin. So it is very difficult to fix those structured data. Because if we need to fix this, we have to fix the entire plugin. So will it affect the ranking for having wrong structured data on the website or invalid structured data on the website? No, it won't affect the ranking, but it might be that we don't show the rich results for that. Okay. Like if, if the markup is such that it doesn't match the requirements anymore, then we wouldn't show those rich results. Uh, so it wouldn't affect the ranking, but it might affect like how it's visible in search. And with okay. that, it might affect how people click, click on the results. So 
even if they rank the same, if users can recognize that this is really a good result uh, with, with the extra structured data, then maybe they'll click more. So it's something where I think it's worthwhile to try to get these fixed. But uh, if it's like, if you can't do it, like you can't do it. But then I, I would consider double checking with the plugin creator to see if they can improve that. Because if they fix the plugin, then that's fixed for everyone. Uh, okay. So that's, I, I think that would be useful. OK, uh, the last question. Uh, sure. This is about redirection. So uh, one of our clients has a lot of pages related to one keyword or the variation of the keyword. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to remove those pages and try to put all the content in one page and redirect those page to the that one page. Now, the rank, uh, the, the, those web page has rank on Google search results. So if we do this, the new page will get the rank or that will take time? That will take time. So okay. yeah. So if you combine multiple pages into one page, then it's not like just adding the page, the, the visible, the, the impressions from all of these pages up and saying, well, it'll rank like three times as much. Um, it'll take a bit of time. Uh, in the beginning, you probably see a short-term effect. And then uh, over time, you'll see that it, it settles down. Uh, I think, in general, it makes sense to combine multiple pages that are on the same topic into one stronger page. Uh, so I, I think that's a good approach. Okay. Thank you, John. Sure. Morning, John. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Uh, great. So we sell floor paint online. Um, and one of our main category pages is floor paint. Now, we're struggling to uh, rank in Google for that page or that category. Um, instead, Google's choosing um, for that particular term, floor paint, to rank one of our product pages. Um, now, we've tried various optimization techniques, um, you know, sorting out the canonical URLs, the H1 tags, on page content, everything. Um, and we're still getting issues with, um, you know, getting that, that category page to rank. Um, I just wonder if you could offer us any advice. Okay, um, so it's basically a product page that is ranking instead of the category page that you'd like. That's yeah. right. Yeah, I mean the product page is still somewhat relevant, but obviously not as relevant as the category page, which has got the keyword in the URL and you know things like that. Okay, and the category page is indexed. So if you yeah, okay. definitely indexed. Okay, so I I think from from a technical point of view, that's pretty much kind of uh, OK in that if, if it's indexed, then we can try to rank it. Uh, what, what is probably, or I don't know, some of the things that you could look at here. Um, one thing is to make sure that the category page is well linked within your website. So if you have multiple products that are all in the same category or related to that category, then link to the category page so that when we crawl the website, we can really understand this category page is actually really important. We should focus okay. on it. So internal linking. Yeah, internal linking is one thing. Another thing that I've, I've sometimes seen, um, especially with e-commerce sites that kind of struggle with this kind of a problem, wow. is that they go to an extreme on the category page in that they include those keywords over and over and over again. And uh, what, what happens in our systems then is we look at this page and we see these keywords repeated so often on that page that we think, well, something is, is kind of fishy with this page with regards to these keywords. Yeah. Maybe we should be more careful when we show it. Uh, so it might be that you're essentially going down. Oops. Uh, Jonathan, I think you're presenting your screen. Uh, it might be that you're kind of overdoing it with the category page, in that it would perhaps make sense to kind of um, move back a little bit and say, I will focus my category page on these keywords and make sure that it's a good page for that, but not go too far overboard. Yeah. Uh, so that when, when we look at this page, we'll see, well, this is a reasonable page. Um, there's good content here. We, we can show it for these terms. We don't have to worry about whether or not someone is trying to unnaturally overdo it with those keywords. 
Yeah, makes sense. And quickly, do you think that obviously backlinks to that specific category page will help alongside obviously, you know, kind of backlink, natural backlinks to the website in general? Yeah, I'm, I mean, that's, that's something that do, doesn't cause any problems. And from our point of view, um, in general, backlinks from other websites are something that we would see as something that would evolve naturally over time. Wow. So I don't think you'd need to go out and kind of artificially build backlinks to a category page like that. Yeah, yeah, OK. Yeah. I, I right. think what, what I would also do in, in a case like this is kind of go with the assumption that you won't be able to fix this very quickly. Um, not, not that it's impossible, but uh, kind of assume that it's, it's going to stick around a little bit, because sometimes our algorithms do take a bit of time to adjust. And yeah. find a way to make it so that when users land on that product page, that they, they realize there's actually a category page that might be more useful to them. So something like a small banner or some other visual element on the page so that when users go to that product page, they can find their way to the category page fairly easily yeah. uh, so that you, you don't have to worry about the short-term problem that maybe the wrong page is, is ranking. And uh, in the meantime, you can kind of work on creating a, a reasonable solution for the category page itself. OK. All right. Thanks for your help. Sure. Uh, John, one related question about rich snippets. OK. Uh, so uh, uh, about uh, final changes in uh, rich snippets, uh, the last changes in rich snippets. So if we have a hotel website, uh, if we embed the review from uh, Google My Business, is possible to show these rich results in SERP or not? If if it's a review about your business on, yes. that's hosted on your business website, then we would not show that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't matter if we uh, use third party like Google My Business. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter where the review comes from. So if mm -hmm. you use... I, I don't know what they're all called, uh, then that's something where it, if it's a review about your business that you're hosting on your business, then we would just not show that in search. Mm -hmm. uh, product reviews are fine. So if you're reviewing a product and that's on your, one of your product pages, that's, that's perfectly fine. OK, thank you. And uh, one related question about uh, the question from uh, last question from the lady. Uh, so uh, your recommendation is uh, for category pages is uh, uh, sometimes you see some uh, um, uh, keywords, uh, target keywords in, on the page, and this is not very natural, looks not very natural. What do you mean? Uh, these keywords are in the product uh, titles uh, or? Um, we so, so what happens in in practice there is our algorithms look at this page and think there's a lot of keyword stuffing stuffing happening, mm -hmm. and uh, then we will be kind of extra critical when it comes to that keyword and that page. Uh, so sometimes we see it that you have a category page, like I don't know about T-shirts and. All of the products that you link have like blue t-shirt, red t-shirt, green t-shirt, and it's like everything t-shirt, 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 t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And then on the bottom, you have a half a Wikipedia page, kind of like t-shirts are made out of cloth, and uh, t-shirts this and t-shirts that. And then that's something where when our algorithms look at this, they're like, there are 500 mentions of the word t-shirt here. Maybe this is not, not the best page to show for this topic. Yeah, I understood. Thank you so much, John. Sure. John, if you let me, I have another question. Um, sure. Uh, let me run through some of the submitted questions first, and okay, okay. then I'll get back to, to, to everyone. Um, okay. Always good to kind of make sure that the people who uh, weren't able to join in person also have a chance to, to get their question asked. Um, I work for an agency that has mostly European clients. For almost all clients, we see a big spike in impressions around the 22nd and 23rd of September, and the next day they went back to normal. Is this a bug in Search Console? Um, I'm not aware of any, any bug related to that. So I don't think there was anything, at least John, from, from what I know. Hey, John, if I may, um, sure. just related to that, there's uh, something I sent you um, a couple of weeks back, and it was around the 29th of September, um, where we saw a huge sort of like increase in 
in, uh, in in searches for this particular keyword. It it went from an average of about seven to eight thousand searches per day to around four four million uh, per day. So that was last we, month, right? Yeah, yeah, that was last month. Um, okay. And that sort of continued. Um, I mean, the numbers are, are becoming smaller, but it's still in the millions. And when we've investigated it, um, we've sort of looked in Google Trends as well, and we've seen the spike for the same keyword as well. Um, and it's a bit odd just because, you know, some countries, for example, if you pop up Google Trends and you you um, put the word loans in there, you'll see that even in Germany, in all these different countries that don't tend to search for the term loans, it just spikes up and it, it correlates with the, the Google Search Console data, um, which lend, which obviously lends me to believe that there's, there's an issue not with Google Search Console, but with um, with Google Search. Like there's some there's some sort of bug or something that's causing uh, Im impression spikes. Yeah, I, I think the team is looking into that. I don't know what, okay. what, what the solution will be there if we can kind of like recalculate the Search Console data and all of that. Uh, but I, I know they are looking into that. Oh, but perfect. That sounds a bit different from from this question, though, where it's like on in September, like on two days, they saw a spike. Um, John, I, the question is, uh, is from me, actually. Oh, fantastic. So um, for one of the clients, which does e-commerce, we saw a spike from 300,000 uh, impressions a day to over 700,000 impressions. The next day, it went back to 300,000. And I have examples from multiple uh, clients in different uh, like areas. Uh, could I ask a colleague of mine that has your email to send you some examples? Sure, sure. OK, thank you. Sounds good. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take a look. I mean, it's w one of the things that, that might be playing a role there uh, is if this is, well, I guess probably not. But uh, we, we have the, the new fresher data in Search Console. And that's calculated in a slightly different way to get the data as quickly as possible into Search Console. Uh, so after, like during that time when it's fresh, then you might see slightly different counts there than you would see when it's kind of settled down. Uh, but it sounds like if it's from the 22nd of September and now is the 27th, then probably that's not what you're seeing. But happy, happy to take a look. OK, thank you. All right. Uh, we have the site where fetching and rendering of above the fold images seems to work well. Um, with the Im URL inspection tool, images don't get indexed in image search, though, and don't get displayed in rich snippets. Above the fold images are lazy loaded. Is indexing for lazy loaded images above the fold not supported? Uh, lazy loading images, if you do them in a way that they work in the URL inspection tool, that is definitely supported for image search. And with that, also for rich snippets, uh, whatever rich snippets rely on images. Um, what might be happening here is that these images are otherwise blocked for image search. Uh, so that could be with the, um, there's a robots meta tag. I, I forgot what it's called, uh, to, to block uh, images from being indexed on a page. That might be something that that is playing a role here. It might be that the images themselves are somehow blocked from, from being indexed in that we can still crawl them, but we can't index them for image search. Um, perhaps that's some, so I, I'm not 100% sure, but it could be that uh, you're blocking the images with robots text, for example. And when we render the page, we can still fetch those images for rendering, but we just can't use them for image search. Uh, so something like that, I suspect, is, is happening here. If we can fetch the images when we render the page, then the lazy loading part, that sounds like that would be OK. Um, and in general, images can be lazy loaded. So that should all kind of work. If you can't get this to work, then send us the URL, maybe post in the Webmaster Help Forum, or drop us a note on Twitter uh, so that we can take a look to see where things are getting stuck. Uh, who do you contact at Google when a malicious site generates 80,000 links to your site and tanks your rankings? Um, 
you, you can send me a note if you want. Uh, in general, though, this is something that our algorithms are pretty good at dealing with. Uh, so that's something that we should be able to deal with without any issues on your site. Lots of spammy sites link all over the web, and uh, they generally don't cause any problems there. Uh, so if you're seeing bigger changes in rankings, then it might also be that these are just normal changes in ranking. Uh, if you're really worried that the site is causing issues with regards to search, uh, then you can use a disavow file. Uh, with the disavow file, you can submit a domain. Uh, so if there's one site that's generating 80,000 pages that link to your, to your site in a way that you don't like, then you can just submit that domain in the disavow file, and all of those links will be ignored. Uh, so that's something that you can kind of take into your own hands if you want. Um, you can also send us a note. We, we can double check with the web spam team. But uh, pretty much all of the cases that uh, people have sent my way, uh, they, they were things where, on our side, we were already essentially ignoring those links. Uh, can you give an example of an excessive link exchange? Um, so there are situations where a link exchange is natural. For example, uh, you write an article that links to a restaurant, and the restaurant might link back to the article. Uh, yes, that, that kind of uh, back and forth linking is completely natural and not something that I would worry about. Uh, it's, it's quite often the case that you have a customer and you, you link to your customer, and your customer is really proud to kind of sell your product, and they link to you as a supplier of the products. This kind of, kind of back and forth linking is just completely natural and not something that I would worry about. Um, the excessive kind of links Oops. OK. The excessive kind of linking, link exchanges are really when tons of sites are linking across each other. So we sometimes see that, that you'll have a group of sites that work together, and in their, their footers, they'll cross-link to all of their, the, the sites that are kind of involved in this kind of link exchange setup. Um, so that's really something where if you're really obviously doing that just for the sake of search engines, and that's something that we might pick up on. Uh, if you're doing this in, in a natural way in that sometimes people link to you and sometimes you link to them, then that's not a problem. Uh, a question about infinite scroll and pagination. What's the SEO-friendly method? Is the article from 2014 still valid? Uh, yes, you can still use the, the setup from the article from 2014. Uh, the important part when it comes to uh, kind of infinite scroll is that we're able to reach all of the pages that you have involved. And the best way to do that is to link to all of those pages individually. Uh, so if you have, for example, something that's set up to do infinite scroll for you, uh, then make sure that you also have kind of pagination links on that, on that page so that you can crawl the individual pages individually as well uh, so that we can pick all of these pages up ourselves. The, the one thing that's no longer necessary from that old article is the rel next and rel previous links. Um, those are things that we don't no longer use when it comes to search. But normal links in pagination, perfectly fine, great way to deal with infinite scroll pagination. Uh, is it mandatory to just have one H1 tag on a web page, or can it be used multiple times? So we, we get this question multiple times as well. Uh, you can use H1 tags as often as you want on a page. There is no limit, neither upper nor lower bound. Uh, H1 elements are a great way to give more structure to a page so that users and search engines can understand which parts of a page are kind of under different headings. Uh, so I would use them in, in the proper way on a page. And especially with HTML5, having multiple H1 elements on a page is, is completely normal and kind of expected. Uh, so it's not something that you need to worry about. Uh, some SEO tools flag this as an issue and say, like, oh, you don't have any H1 tags, or you have two H1 tags. Uh, from our point of view, that's not a critical issue. Uh, 
Um, from a usability point of view, maybe it makes sense to, to improve that. Uh, so it's not that I would completely ignore those suggestions, but I wouldn't see it as a critical issue. Uh, your site is going to rank perfectly fine with no H1 tags or with five H1 tags. Uh, are there plans to have Google My Business data and reporting rolled into Search Console? Similarly, are there plans to have the Search Console geographic drill down further than just country? Um, so I'm not aware of either of those plans. Uh, I think it would be pretty cool to have more Google My Business data in Search Console. Uh, in, in the past, these have been clearly separated. So it's not something that's like really overlapping. Um, but maybe that makes sense. I, I don't know. I, I, to be honest, I don't know exactly what data is shown in Google My Business dashboard. Uh, with regards to further drill downs uh, than just country, I don't, I don't know if that would be easily doable in Search Console, uh, just because of the, the way that the UI is set up. Um, but that seems like a good feature request. So what I would do there, and probably also for the Google My Business data, is to make sure to submit feedback directly in Search Console. Um, the, the team actively goes through that feedback uh, on a regular basis. So uh, if this is something that lots of people think would be really useful, then who knows? Maybe they can find a way to make it work. Uh, we fold our text with CSS so that the page is not too long. This is seen as a positive by users surveyed. In former times, it was said that this could be done for mobile pages. We also do this on our desktop page. Uh, since we switched to mobile-first indexing, our idea is it wouldn't hurt desktop. Is that true? Um, or are our long explanatory text no longer so important from Google's point of view because you only see the headline, the rest is only visible after clicking? Um, so I think there, there are two aspects here. Uh, one is if users don't need these texts, then maybe you don't need them on your pages anyway. Uh, so that's kind of the, the kind of more general thing. Uh, like if you're hold, folding these these long texts back with CSS and people have to click on them to actually see the text, you can track on your side if users are actually using that to expand that text. And if nobody is expanding that text, then maybe this text isn't really useful for people, and maybe you can save yourself a lot of kind of questions and trouble by just getting rid of the text that would otherwise be kind of folded away like that. So that's, I, I think, the, the one thing to, to kind of first figure out. Because if you, can, if you can remove that text, then you don't have to think about, like, how do I implement it? Um, with regards to implementation, uh, when it comes to mobile-first indexing, we will index only the, the content on the mobile version of the page. Uh, so if you have different content, different HTML that you serve to mobile users and desktop users, we will only use the mobile content. And we will use that content to rank both the mobile and the desktop page. Uh, so if you're changing something on your mobile site, then that would be reflected in the desktop search results as well. It's not that we would say, well, the desktop site says this, so we'll rank it like this. And the mobile site says something different, we'll rank it slightly differently. Uh, so in that regard, uh, if you've changed it on the mobile site and we switch to mobile-first indexing, we're already using that for indexing. Uh, why do sites that have thousands of spammy backlinks get ranked higher? Uh, so yeah, I don't know. That seems like, like a bad thing, right? Uh, so on, on the one hand, we, we can sometimes get things wrong. So that's, that's always an option, uh, that uh, maybe we're getting something wrong. Maybe we're not recognizing problematic things on a site. And in cases like that, always feel free to send us a spam report. That's something that the web spam team uh, really appreciates. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes sites have lots of spammy backlinks, and they rank despite those spammy backlinks. So uh, what, what often happens is, on the, on the one hand, we try to ignore all of these spammy backlinks. Uh, so maybe a site is just ranking based on other signals. Uh, there are also cases where our algorithms might look at this and say, well, there's so many spammy backlinks here that we can't just ignore them. We have to assume that there's kind of a lot of malicious intent here, and we have to be even more careful. 
And in cases like that, we might demote a site, a site slightly in search, so it wouldn't rank as visibly. However, it might have tons of really good signals that are also associated with that site. And that might mean that we show it a little bit lower, but it's still fairly high in the search results. Uh, so just because something has spammy backlinks doesn't mean we would not show it in search. Uh, we try to take those spammy backlinks into account, uh, essentially by trying to ignore them or, or trying to treat them appropriately. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the site wouldn't show up in search. And I, I think a really good reason for, for us doing it like that is that there are lots of people who are confused and don't really know what they should be doing when it comes to search. And they get advice from, from all kinds of people. And uh, these are people who might know what they're talking about. And there might be people who have no idea what they're talking about. And uh, a lot of these sites that, that are a bit confused, they, they end up doing weird things. Uh, more or less accidentally because they don't know what they should be doing better. Uh, so this is something that we saw quite a bit, I don't know, in the early days, where people would be doing crazy keyword stuffing on their pages because they thought the more that you mention these keywords, the more the site will rank for those keywords. And when we looked at that, we realized that these were not malicious spammers who are trying to abuse our systems, but rather just people who don't know what to do. Uh, so that's kind of where our idea of, well, if we can just ignore the problematic things that they do, then we can focus on the good things that they do, and we can rank a site based on that. Uh, so that's, in, in short, kind of why you might see this kind of situation, where you see a competitor or another site ranking fairly well in the search results, and you dig into that site to try to figure out like what, what kind of magic trick did they find. They have all of this spammy stuff, and they're still ranking high. And it's like, should I do spammy stuff as well? And on, on the one hand, I don't think it makes sense to copy what other people are doing. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also worth thinking that maybe there are other things that this site is doing really well. And it's not so much the spammy stuff that is making the site rank well. Um, are the core updates based mainly on content or mix of content and links? Uh, the, the core updates that we make uh, essentially affect the, the core ranking algorithms that we use. And for that, we use lots of different signals. So it's not just the content, not just the links. Uh, branded terms, uh, for example, Harley-Davidson versus kind of do two words. Um, I write content for authorized Harley-Davidson motorcycle dealers, and I keep losing my rankings uh, because customers don't search with the dash uh, or with the hyphen. Um, and for trademark rules, I need to keep the hyphen. So what, what, what can we do there, essentially? Uh, so th there are two things here. Uh, on the one hand, I, I took a look at some of the search results. Uh, for with a hyphen versus without a hyphen. And we do recognize that these are synonyms. And we, we do try to treat them the same, more or less. So that's something where I wouldn't see the, the hyphen itself as being a reason for, for your pages not to be able to rank. Uh, that's, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that uh, if you want to appear in the search results for what people are searching, then maybe it makes sense to, to have content written in a way that matches what people are searching for. Uh, so hyphen or not is probably like on, on the scale of things like a trivial thing. And it's not going to be affecting that. Uh, but you could imagine situations where maybe you have a, a pharmace pharmaceutical um, product which has a fancy medical name and has a, a kind of a general colloquial name as well. And users might be searching for that easier name because that's something that they hear about from their friends. And if you're only using the fancy medical name on your pages, then you're going to have trouble ranking for those terms. And uh, whether or not you have trademark rules or guidelines that say that you should only be using this kind of long medical name, um, if you don't use the words that people are using to search for your pages, then it's going to be trickier to rank for those terms. It's not 
impossible. Like we, we can understand like in the case like with a dash or not, that's something easy to understand. Even in the case of a, a kind of a long medical name versus a colloquial name, that's something we can try to figure out that these are similar or synonyms. Um, but if you're not mentioning what people are actually searching for, then you're going to have a hard time. Uh, so if you're writing content for users and you know they're searching in a particular way, then try to take that into account. Uh, duplicate content. I'm sharing all my content across different platforms like Medium, LinkedIn, Tumblr, and cryptocurrency blogging platforms. That that one kind of stands out a little bit. Uh, will I be penalized if Google crawls the same exact articles across the web? Uh, no, you will not be penalized for having the same exact content across the web, even if it's on cryptocurrency blogs. Um, but you are competing with yourself. So if you have exactly the same content on multiple different websites, all of these pages can rank. And all of these pages can collect signals in that Maybe people link to these articles because they're really great articles, uh, but they're all still competing with each other. And if you're writing in a very competitive niche, then that kind of competing with yourself could be making your pages less visible. So it's not that Google would be penalizing your site or your content and say, well, this guy has his content even on a cryptocurrency blog. Uh, it's more that you're competing with yourself. Like this article on LinkedIn is competing with the one on Medium, competing with the one on Tumblr. Um, all of these things are essentially competing for the same terms. So usually what, what I recommend is to try to find one platform where you can be kind of keep your content and have that content be really strong. So instead of having all of the signals that are associated, kind of some going to Medium, some going to LinkedIn, some going to, to a blog, um, have all of those signals concentrated on one version of your content. Uh, that way, we can recognize that this content is actually really important, uh, that it's something that is kind of unique out there. And especially in the competitive landscape, we can take that into account and say, well, like these other articles are pretty good, but look at this one article that's like seen as the authority on this topic. Uh, then that makes it a lot easier for us to rank that piece of content. Uh, so my my recommendation there, especially if if you're kind of struggling with getting your content shown in search, is try to concentrate things on one platform as much as possible. Sometimes it makes sense to reach out to other platforms and also give some information there. Um, but the goal, I think, should be in the long run to make sure that your version of this content, wherever you want to kind of place your primary place of residence, uh, essentially online, uh, that that version is seen as kind of the authority on this topic rather than that you're spreading things around to everyone else. Um, then cloaking, infinite scroll. I think we talked about this a bit. So infinite scroll, just you ideally use the pagination links. Um, then a question about the coverage report. Um, oh my gosh, this is a fairly long question. I probably need to look into that separately. So if if you're kind of writing really long questions uh, specific to your site specific to something uh, kind of that, that you're seeing with your pages, I'd recommend taking that to the Webmaster Help Forum, uh, where people can kind of drill into the specific problem that you're seeing and might be able to give you some advice and tips on what you can do to make that a little bit easier. Um, uh, last week, you replied on Twitter about updating a URL. Uh, an example, consider that the previous webmasters created an inappropriate URL, say very long ones, and now we're updating to shorter, smarter ones. How does Google handle that? I always see traffic drops in the URL after updating it. It takes some time to recover. Um, yeah, I, in general, anytime you make bigger changes on a site, you will see some time for things to settle down again. If you're doing this like on, on a one URL basis, where you take one URL and you redirect to, to another one, that's usually something that we can figure out fairly quickly. 
If you're doing this on a broader scale, like you're cleaning up the old URL structure that someone has created that has these gigantic URLs, and you're cleaning that up, uh, then keep in mind that we essentially need to reprocess the whole website to understand the new context of all of these pages on your site. Uh, so that's something that will take a bit longer, where I'd expect, I don't know, order of a couple weeks to a couple months at least uh, for things to settle down again. Um, I am a webmaster of a new site. Even though we rank several times a day, we appear in Google Discover every now and then. I've recently noticed that Google indexes our content 30 minutes after we published it, uh, which for news out outlet is an eternity. Could this be an issue regarding our sitemap or some meta tag that we're missing uh, or something about our content? It could be any of those, yes. Um, it sounds like you're, you're kind of on the right track there. Uh, in general, from, from a content point of view, that's something that is, is definitely important. Uh, from a crawling point of view, there, there are things you really need to watch out for so that we can pick up content quickly. Uh, so in particular, what I try to make sure is that you have kind of hub pages on your website. So if your news website, that your homepage lists the, the recent articles, or that you have different categories uh, different kinds of news on your site that those news kind of category pages list all of the recent articles. So in, in that case, what, what can happen or what usually happens with news sites is we crawl those home pages and category pages a lot more frequently than everything else. And we'll try to pick up links to the new articles as quickly as possible. And if we can crawl those pages, find links to the new articles, we can try to index those new articles as quickly as possible. So that's even without anything from a sitemap side, that's one thing I would always make sure to do, uh, that we can go from kind of these hubs within a new site and find all of the new articles extremely quickly. Uh, with a sitemap file, that's something you can help us even more. Uh, sitemap or RSS feed, both of those kind of work. Um, what's important for both of these is that you have the last modification date of the pages uh, specified there as well, so that when we look at the sitemap file and we find a new URL in the sitemap file, we, we can look at the date and see, well, this is something that is new. We really need to pick that up as quickly as possible. Uh, so that's kind of the, the main thing there. Uh, the other thing, which is probably more on a basic technical level, is especially for news websites, we have to be able to crawl quickly so that we can index quickly. Uh, so for that, we need to be able to access the server quickly. We need to have the pages come quickly. Um, all of these speed things are elements that, that are kind of critical to us. Uh, and uh, we, we have an article on our blog, I think from last year, that talks about this a little bit. It's uh, the crawl budget article from Gary uh, that goes into some of the kind of aspects that are involved with being able to crawl a website quickly or not being able to crawl it so quickly. So those are kind of the directions I would take there. Uh, I don't think there's like, for most cases, there's not just one magic bullet that you can kind of tweak, and suddenly you'll be crawled and indexed in, in minutes. Uh, but usually, it's a, it's a combination of different things, especially if you're seeing 30 minutes, then most things will probably be right. Uh, and maybe it's a matter of tweaking some of these things to make it a little bit better so that you can get that time down to, I don't know, a minute or two. Um, let's see. I think we have like 10 minutes left. Maybe I'll just switch over to, to questions from you all. I'm sure things there might be some things that, that we can kind of help clarify as well. Hi, John. Hi. How are you? Pretty good. How are you? I'm great. So here's my question. Let's say uh, I have two brands in the same niche, very competitive niche say brand A and brand B. Each one of them, you now those two brands have basically the same content. So just for the example, let's say we're talking about uh, the travel in industry. So both brands have like uh, hotels and flights and so on. Now, each one of those brands have a different CMS and the business wants to migrate 
to the CMS of brand A. So to take brand B and migrate it to the CMS of brand A. Now, the difference between those uh, two brands are uh, in the URL structure. So in brand B, the URL structure is mu goes much deeper. So let's say if you're talking about hotels, then let's say you'll have cities on brand B, while on brand A, you'll have only states, for example. So on this aspect, the risk is already known. If, if I will migrate to the basically URL, URL structure of brand A, I will lose all those deeper pages and uh, we lose traffic. But my other question basically is uh, because those two brands, uh, once they will be on the same platform, on the same CMS, will look the same. So same uh, UI, UX, and same URL structure, would this might be a risk uh, for, I don't know if duplicate websites, but uh, is this a, a risk like having exactly the same two brands uh, that looks exactly the same, offer the same uh, uh, products and events, uh, is this might be a risk for brand A in case brand B will migrate to its platform? Um, probably, yeah. So there, there are two aspects there. Uh, one is essentially a redesign of a website. So you're taking the existing website and you're redesigning it, creating a new URL structure, uh, creating new layouts, creating new new sets of internal links um, by by moving from one CMS to kind of the other setup. That's something that can take quite a bit of time to settle down. So especially if you're changing the URL structure, if you're changing kind of the the layout of of the site in general, then that's something where I I would expect that this would take a significant amount of time to, to settle down. And it's something that you need to be really careful about when doing the, the migration. So tracking things like all of the old URLs, making sure that they all have redirects to the new URLs. If you're merging pages or splitting pages, then make sure you're tracking all of that separately. And uh, that's something where, from a crawling and indexing point of view, we need to be able to understand the new structure of the website first. And that can take quite a bit of time, especially if you have a website that has a ton of content. Uh, so yep. when you're talking about travel sites, often it's like there's tons of content out there. And moving that to a new URL setup, that's going to take, I don't know, I'm just throwing numbers out, uh, but probably three to six months at least to, to settle down. Uh, so that's kind of the one thing to, to watch out for. The other thing that you already mentioned as well is that if this new setup that you have matches a different website that you're running, then especially if the, the content also matches, like you're selling the same products, the same flights, the same hotels, you have the same descriptions on both of these sites, then it can happen that we will look at these pages and say, well, these are essentially equivalent. Uh, the brand name is different on these. but the content is exactly the same. Uh, we will pick one as a canonical. And we'll just index that version, uh, the canonical version of that content. And what might happen there is that suddenly everything switches over to one website, or some content switches to one, and some content switches to the other one. It's kind of hard to say ahead of time how, how that will pan out. But if it's the same content, then technically that makes sense. It's not that this would be a bad thing from, from our point of view. Uh, so assuming that this can happen across these two websites, one thing you might want to consider as well is just say, well, if Google will see these as the same website anyway, why don't I just migrate both of these kind of sites to one website and make one really strong website rather than have two that are essentially providing the same content? Uh, so that's one thing to kind of think about there. Uh, if these two brands are really positioned differently, and the, from the content point of view, you really have different content, uh, maybe one is, I don't know, targeted for uh, business travelers, the other one for kind of, I don't know, last minute people who are just traveling for fun, um, then maybe it makes sense to keep those separate. But then I would make sure that the content is also really different. And then 
I, I don't see a problem with, with having two of these sites kind of doing similar things if you're really targeting completely different uh, target areas and uh, you're really providing content that's different when people look at these pages. But if you're providing the same content uh, across both of these sites, I would assume that our systems will say, well, this is kind of the same. Maybe we should just fold it together. Yeah, well, basically, it's not the same content exactly. Like, the, the user values are pretty different, and uh, the target audience is a bit different, even though uh, we're talking about the same uh, niche or the same industry. Nevertheless, uh, my big concern was just because of the similarity of both the URL structure and the site, uh, the design of the website, uh, that it might be considered as, a, as duplicate. Uh, so I'm just asking specifically more, let's say I, the content is different, but the brands looks like pretty much the same. You know, different colors and different icons and logos and stuff, but like yeah. the, the basic structure of the website is, is identical. I, I think if it's purely the structure, that's no problem. Uh, if the content is really equivalent or identical, that's where we would kind of think about, or well, maybe it's the same thing. So you, you can think about it kind of like uh, a blog. Like A lot of different blogs are set up in the same way. They have the same URL structure, the same kind of heading and sidebar type thing, but they're very different blogs. So it makes sense to index them individually. Um, however, if the content were also the same, then that would be a case where we would say, well, they look the same. They have the same content. Maybe we should fold some of these together. Uh, so that's kind of where where I would watch out for. Like if it's not like the the uh, the design and the, the URL structure is not really what I would worry about when folding things together. It's really the content itself. Got you. Thank you so much, John. Hey, John. I've got a quick question on um, if we can go back to structured data. Is okay. it possible to have um, FAQ page markup structured data and product um, review rating show up simultaneously in the search results? I don't know. You can try okay. it out. So we can test. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Test. yeah. Um, so some, some types of structured or, or rich results we, we can combine in the search results, and some kind of clash in the sense that uh, it, it just doesn't work well in the search results together. Uh, so we, we only show one or the other. Uh, when it comes to situations where we show one or the other, it's not possible for you to kind of give prioritization. Say, I prefer to have my product review shown and not the FAQ if you have to pick one, uh, but rather our algorithms will, will try to pick one and not show the other. Uh, sorry for that. It's possible. We have okay. it. Yeah. Oh, oh you, you have, have it. it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh my gosh, Jonathan can <laughs> run off and implement it everywhere now. <laughs> cool. Okay. Joe, may I ask my question? Sure. Okay. Uh, me and also my competitors are hiding our advertisement on our page from the Google board. I am wondering that is it a kind of harmful or not? Because they are content and we are <laughs> hiding it, but they are ads, not the, the, the real content. In general, you wouldn't need to hide ads on a page. So that's something where, from from our point of view, like having ads on a page is is normal. That's it's not not going to be a problem. Um, what what I do know is that a lot of ad networks have their their ads blocked by robots text just so that they don't don't yeah. get kind of bad impressions, those kind of things. That's that's perfectly fine. Oh okay, okay, thank you. Sure. Hey John. Okay, let let me just pause the recording here. You're welcome to stick around a little bit longer, uh, but kind of so that we have a reasonable length for the the YouTube recording. Um, thank you all for joining in. Um, I hope this was useful, and I wish you all a fantastic weekend. And now to find the pause button.